Good, good morning, and welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Council Member uh, Francisco Moy, the Chairperson of this Subcommittee, uh, and we are here today uh, to take on a couple of items that uh, are on our agenda. Uh, if you are here to testify on the application for which uh, the record is not already closed, uh, please fill out a white speaker slip uh, with the sergeant at arms and indicate the name and or LU number of the application you wish to testify uh, on that slip. Uh, first, we will be laying over resolution 748, an authorizing resolution pursuant to section 363 of the city charter, also known as the Staten Island Bus Franchising Resolution. Uh, we are also Uh, but before we begin our first public hearing, I'd uh, like to welcome a uh, former uh, council member and uh, chair of the Land Use uh, Committee. Uh, former council member David Greenfield is here, uh, and he is here with uh, his uh, Brooklyn Law students. Uh, welcome to uh, the city council and welcome to this committee. Thank you uh, for always uh, being here uh, with us. Uh, okay, our first public hearing for today is on LU-359, an application uh, by Th Thasbul uh, LLC for a revocable consent for the renew renewal of a enclosed, uh, an un unenclosed sidewalk cafe located at 250 Park Avenue South in Manhattan in Council Member Rivera's district. Uh, I now open up the public hearing on this application. Do we have anybody? No, no. Uh, Councilwoman uh, Rivera is not here at the moment, but uh, she asked us to read this uh, letter of agreement. Uh, it says, Dear Council Member uh, Rivera, as you are aware, this office represents the above reference restaurant in the application for a sidewalk cafe. Uh, your office and I have been reviewing the application and have reached a mutual uh, agreeable compromise as follows. Uh, the application will be reduced in size from its current 12 table uh, to 31 seats uh, and 31 seats as approved by uh, DCA to six tables and 21 seats. Uh, specifically, all of the tables on 20th Street will be eliminated and the tables on Park Avenue South will be reduced to a total of three tables on either side of the entrance as shown on the attached revised plan. The closing hours of the cafe will be 11 p.m. on Friday and Saturday uh, and 10 p.m. for all other nights. Uh, all the planters will be removed from Park Avenue South at all time during the cafe uh, session when the sidewalk cafe is in operation. Uh, thank you for working with this restaurant uh, operator, a longtime member of this community. There are very these are very tough economic times for restaurants, and the addition of a cafe will be welcome indeed. Yours truly, uh, Robert Bookman. Uh, are there any members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application. Uh, and we are going to our next uh, our first public hearing is on the pre-considered LUs uh, for the 245 East 53rd Street rezoning for property in Council Member Powers District in Manhattan. The applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to establish a new C25 commercial overlay district within an existing R8B district which would affect 27 lots along the north and south sides of East 53rd Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenues. This action would permit commercial ground floor use in a, a new six-story building on the north side of the street, as well as bringing into uh, conformance 25 lots which currently have existing commercial use. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application and call up uh, Jay Goldstein and Gabby Vinbatel. All right, close? Close enough, all right. Um, Council, would you please swear in the panel? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? And please state your name uh, for the record. 
Uh, Gary Van Batel, the owner. Good morning, council member. Thank you for having us this morning. Uh, my name is Jay Goldstein, and I'm here on behalf of 245 East 53rd Street LL Realty LLC. With me is my client, Gary Vinbaitel, who's the owner of the site, the development site that will be discussed uh, within our presentation. The proposal today is to create a, is for a zoning map amendment to create a commercial overlay along the portion of East 53rd Street between 2nd and 3rd Avenue. The proposed zoning map amendment will create a C25 commercial overlay within the existing R8D zoning district. The project area bounded by the uh, yellow dots has 27 properties. Um, the development site, which is highlighted in yellow, is owned and controlled by my, by my client. The rezoning itself would map a uh, C25 commercial overlay 100 feet from 2nd Avenue and 150 feet from 3rd Avenue. The proposal would allow for a 2FAR commercial and it would not change the residential or community facility bulk to the area. Uh, as can be seen from the uh, area map and the land use map, of the, uh, of the 27 pack lots within the area, 23 of them already have um, commercial uses at the ground floor and basement. These are grandfathered uses and we seek to bring those into compliance with current zoning, as well as to allow for commercial use at the ground floor of our newly developed building. Here's a picture of our building, which was recently developed, as, uh, approved as a six-story uh, commercial, or er, sorry, residential and community facility building, community facility at the ground floor, with one one unit residential above. The building is currently built and awaiting its CFO for the current approved uses. Here you can see pictures of the um, state of the street, ground floor is predominantly commercial and basement level is predominantly commercial with residential above. While most of them have CFOs, they predate uh, the current zoning, and the current zoning of the RAD doesn't reflect the state of the street. Here are some additional pictures of the state of the street. City planning and the borough president's office and the city plan and uh, the community board all supported the application as being something that recognizes the current um, makeup of the street and the current uses of the of the buildings along the rezoning area. You can see from this chart. Um, the areas in pink are all areas that are already commercial or com uh, already commercial uses with re residential above. The four areas not including our site are community facility buildings, and our property, which is built as a community facility and residential, would be converted ground floor to uh, commercial. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. <coughs> uh, one quick question. Uh, what are some of the existing uh, uses that are being uh, brought into compliance with uh, the commercial overlay? It's almost entirely um, restaurants. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public uh, who wish to testify? Seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and uh, it will be laid over. Um, our next uh, public hearing for today is on uh, pre-considered LUs uh, for 1640 Flatbush Avenue rezoning for property in Council District uh, 45 in Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to rezone the developed site from a uh, C82 to an R6 district to a C4 uh, 4D district and other portions of the rezoning area from a C82 district to an R6 district. A uh, related zoning text amendment uh, application seeks to establish a proposed C4 uh, 4D district as a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option two. Uh, as proposed, these actions would facilitate the development of a new 13-story mixed-use building, including retail use on the ground and second floors, and approximately 114 total dwelling units, including 34 affordable units and 40 uh, below-grade ac uh, accessory uh, parking spaces. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, and we call up uh, Dan uh, Eggers and Harry I'm sorry, you can't really read your handwriting, but it says Sitomer? Sitomer. Got it. Harry and Dan. Uh, Council, if you can please swear in the panel. Uh, as part of your response, please state your name for the record. 
do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Good morning, Chair Moya, Dan Eggers, land use attorney at Greenberg Traurig, representing the owner of 1640 Flatbush Avenue. We're before you today for a rezoning application that would facilitate the development of a 13-story plus cellar building with commercial use on the first and second floors and residential above that would include up to approximately 34 units of permanently affordable housing. I'm joined by Harry Satomer, representing the developer, also here to answer any questions you may have are Heik Aristamian of S9 Architecture and Lisa Lau of AKRF. Before I present their application, I turn to Harry to say a few words. Harry? Uh, my name is Harry Satomer. If you can uh, please press the button to turn on your mic. There we go. My name is Harry Satomer. Uh, I represent the developer SL Green Realty Corp. Uh, I am a vice president at the company. Uh, this is a project that we've been working on for close to four years now. Uh, and something that we're very excited to present to you today. We think we've assembled a great team and I want to reiterate uh, our commitment to getting this project done. So I'd like to turn it back to Dan and I'm available to answer any questions at the end. Thank you, Harry. The site is on the west side of Flatbush Avenue at Aurelia Court next to the Triangle Junction Shopping Center. Until 2017, it was occupied by a BP gas station. The site is approximately 18,000 square feet. About 15,000 square feet is in a CA2 zoning district that does not allow residential use. The remaining 3,000 square feet is in an R6 district that permits residential use. These districts allow a maximum of 4.8 FAR and have no maximum building height limit. Our application would rezone the entire development site to a C4-4D zoning district subject to mandatory inclusionary housing. So residential use would be permitted on the entirety of the site. That's an R8A residential equivalent. Also, at the request of the Department of City Planning, the remainder of the C82 <coughs> district on two adjacent residential properties to the west will be rezoned to an R6 district. That's the tail portion you see on the tax map. So that those properties would be uniformly R6 and their uses would conform to zoning. The C4-4D district allows 7.2 FAR, 2.4 FAR more than the 4.8 FAR currently allowed and has a 145 foot or 14 story maximum building height for buildings with on-site affordable housing and a qualifying ground floor. Since the site is about 18,000 square feet, approximately 130,000 square feet of floor area would be allowed. If the rezoning were approved, our client would develop a 13-story plus cellar, approximately 130,000 square foot, 7.2 FAR building with 30,000 square feet of commercial use on the ground and second floors. That's about 1.7 FAR. 3.4 FAR of commercial use is permitted and 100,000 square feet of residential floor area. That's about 5.5 FAR. The ULERB application proposes that the residential floor area um, equaling approximately 30 percent would be permanently affordable consistent with option two of the mandatory inclusionary housing program. If there are approximately 114 total units, so under option two, there would be approximately 80 market rate and 34 affordable units. Based on conversations with then Council Member Williams and the Department of City Planning, the 13-story portion of the building has been massed along Flatbush Avenue to be in context with the 20-story Phil Power Departments across Flatbush Avenue, and you can see those in the background of that rendering. Here is a rendering of the building from Flatbush Avenue. As you can see, the 13-story portion is massed along Flatbush. There is a shallow seven-story portion along Aurelia Court, which is intended to provide a transition from the medium-rise uh, six-story plus basement buildings adjacent there too, including 3111 Aurelia Court adjacent to the west. The seven-story portion, as shown on the site plan, is only approximately 35 feet deep. The rest of the building along its western lot line is only one or two stories. And the 13-story portion is at least 30 feet from the lot line, and this distance increases due to the angled configuration that you see there. 
The building would fully comply with the C4-4D district's regulations. The seven-story, 84-foot base site would comply with the 60-foot minimum and 105-foot maximum base sites. The required 15-foot setback from a really port and 10-foot setback from Flatbush Avenue, a wide street, would be provided, and the building would rise to a total height of 13 stories or 142 feet in compliance with the 14-story, 145-foot height limit. Zoning requires that parking spaces be provided for 50% of the market rate units and no spaces are required for the affordable units since the site is in a transit zone. One space must be provided for each thousand square feet of floor area for retail use, but this requirement's waived if no more than 40 spaces are required. If there are approximately 80 market rate units and 34 affordable units, 40 residential spaces would be required, and since there'd be about 30,000 square feet of retail use, the parking requirement for retail uses would be waived. The 40 required parking spaces would be provided below grade on a single level on stackers. That would be attended parking. We know this community is underserved by parks and open space. The building will include about 2,800 square feet of recreation space accessible to all building residents. We believe there's a sound land use rationale for the rezoning. In view of the surrounding residential use, access to mass transit, and the need for housing, this site is suited for residential use. And given its location on Flatbush Avenue, this is a site where added density is appropriate. The 7.2 FAR would be 2.4 FAR, more than the 4.0 FAR currently permitted, and would be more in line with the 6.5 FAR currently allowed in the CA4 district immediately to the north. And the building would be in context, as its 13-story height would be less than the 20 stories of the Phil Power Departments. We respectfully request your approval and welcome any questions. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, do you have a uh, local hiring plan? So, yes, we have considered this, and as part of what we have discussed with the borough president, um, there are company-wide goals regarding the participation of um, MWBEs and LBEs and will use commercially reasonable efforts to pursue the hiring of and prioritize retaining LBEs as subcontractors, especially those that are designated as MWBEs. And we hope to meet or exceed the standards of local law one of 2013, which is a 20% target. And, and right. Oh, and I was about to say that um, I believe they're here to testify, but we've reached an agreement with 32BJ to use their services in the building. Oh, you answered my second question. <laughs> um, so why did you choose to map uh, MIH option two uh, over option one, uh, since option one was the request of uh, then Council Member Williams uh, since the beginning of this project? So um, Harry, I'm gonna let, let you address yes. that. Yes, so we understand and respect uh, the Council Member's request um, we certainly uh, will continue the dialogue with the council. Uh, the project does make more sense from us from an efficiency standpoint to do option two, uh, but we are, of course, always open to conversation with the council. Just, just so you know that, you know, we, we see this constantly come up, but this is targeting the higher level incomes uh, that would be able to, to, to come into these buildings when. Uh, option one would give more affordability uh, to people that actually live in that community. And I think that that is uh, a real concern, uh, not just for uh, uh, Council Member Williams or former Council Member Williams, uh, but I think for all of us that sit uh, on this committee is that we want to see that when projects like this come up in our communities, uh, we want to make sure that the options that are being given before approval are those that are reflective of the incomes in that area so that folks aren't being priced out uh, of the area that they live in. Um, what will the commercial use uh, be for? We've, so there'll be two levels of commercial use plus the lower level parking. Uh, we have had conversations with plenty of local retailers as well as some larger brands like the companies that you see at the Target Junction 
Uh, I would say that it is a little too early in the project uh, to certainly line up a retailer at this point. Uh, it's hard enough in this retail climate to get a retailer signed up with a building built. Here we have to get through A, getting approval, and B, actually building the building, but we certainly are committed to signing up retailers that will benefit both the project as well as the local area and the residents that will be living in the building. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call up uh, the next panel, uh, Avi uh, Lesher and uh, Madeline uh, McElroy and Morgan Perlman. And we are also been joined by uh, Council Member uh, Grudenchek uh, <laughs> and uh, 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 Council Member Jonai. Uh, you may uh, uh, begin once you've introduced yourself, you may begin uh, your testimony. Good morning. My name is Morgan Perlman, and I'm here representing the Association for a Better New York, ABNI. We're a 47-year-old civic organization that promotes the effective cooperation of public and private sectors to improve the quality of life for all New Yorkers. On behalf of ABNI, thank you for the opportunity to express our support of the proposed redevelopment of 1640 Flatbush as proposed by SL Green. The project proposes a mixed-use project including retail, 34 units of permanently affordable housing, and a community-oriented use to be determined in partnership with the community. In addition to the transit-oriented development nature of the project that fits within the city, city's overall plans for smart growth, we believe the proposal will provide significant improvements to the immediate vicinity. By replacing a gas station with a mixed-use development, the project would provide continuous street-level use and would add activity to what is currently a gas station, a use that creates heavy, heavy intersections between pedestrians and automobiles on a main Brooklyn thoroughfare. Although there is a borough-wide concern to maintain the number of gas stations with an accessible distance to drivers, the neighborhood will have many vi viable alternatives. The proposed development will also match the immediately adjacent uses at Triangle Junction while providing a transition to residential buildings surrounding the site. To help with the affordability crisis we are facing in our city, we need to continue to create capacity for housing development in all areas of our city for all income levels. However, given the congestion and strains on our infrastructure we see today, in addition to the anticipated demand we expect by the over 9 million New Yorkers by 2040, it becomes imperative to focus on and promote reasonable and contextual growth in areas that are well served by public transit, as is this area in Flatbush Avenue. The 1640 Flatbush proposal is sensitive to the surrounding buildings and is architecturally coherent with the existing buildings in the area. We urge the committee to approve this mixed-use proposal. Thank you again, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify this morning. Good morning, Chairperson Moya, members of the committee, and guests. My name is Avi Lechis, and I am the Director of Economic Development at the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce. The Brooklyn Chamber is the borough's leading voice for Brooklyn's business community. We promote economic development across the borough of Brooklyn, as well as advocate for on behalf of our member businesses. We are pleased to be here today to support the development of a residential and commercial building at 1640 Flatbush Avenue by SL Green. The project will provide affordable housing of which 34 of these units will be permanently affordable. The affordable housing component of this project will be overseen by a local Brooklyn-based organization. In addition, SL Green will work directly with the community in its application to ensure that the neighborhood stays affordable for its current residents. In regard to the streetscape and the contextual design, there will be a retail on the first floor and second floors that will in turn provide a lively streetscape that can continue to provide the overall area. In addition, SL Green will seek to fill the retail space based on the needs of the identified by the community. Possible tenants could include a grocery store or an urgent care, for example. The current space is an empty gas station and its proposed project will reinvigorate the area while also increasing the safety of the area as well. The location of the project will also help to attract folks to the neighborhood since the proposed project is near the Flappish Junction Transit Hub. Lastly, the architect who has been hired for this project has worked to create a design that's complementary of the neighborhood. It is imperative as a borough that we manage growth carefully. Considering all the public benefits of this project, 1640 Flappish Avenue is an example of smart development we need. Therefore, the Brooklyn Chamber is here today to express support for this project, and we urge you to do so as well. Thank you for, you, thank you for the opportunity to testify. 
Madeline McGorry, Real Estate Board of New York. Re the Real Estate Board strongly supports the approval of the rezoning and related text amendment to apply mandatory inclusionary housing for property located at 1640 Flatbush in the borough of Brooklyn. The applicant proposes an amendment to the zoning text and to Appendix F of the zoning resolution to change the development site from C82 and R6 districts to C44D or R8 equivalent, R8A equivalent. This will regularize the zoning rules for an irregular shaped lot and facilitate the development of a 13 story mixed use building containing 114 dwelling units, of which approximately 34 units will be permanently affordable at an average of 80% of AMI. The proposed changes advances the city's affordable housing goals on a privately owned site. In addition to the provision of permanently affordable housing, building service jobs and jobs related to the provision of 30,000 square feet of commercial space on the first and second floors of the building will be added to the neighborhood. These jobs will be in close proximity to transit hubs, which has been shown to reduce a neighborhood's carbon footprint. The ground floor retail space will also help to enliven the streetscape. Currently, the street is considered unsafe and unsightly by the empty, hazardous gas station that occupies the frontage along Flatbush Avenue on Aurelia Court. The applicant has also been responsive throughout the community engagement process. SL Green will uphold their commitment to the community by seeking to fill the first floor retail area with businesses aligned with the needs of the community, such as healthcare provider, community facility, or grocery store. <coughs> when considering the appropriateness of zoning map changes, the commission is charged with judging whether the changes meet the goals of the city and the text amendments consistent with the zoning resolutions framework. This proposal adds density to a site well served by transit and advances other important policy goals. The provision of permanently affordable housing meets a central tenant of the mayor's housing New York plan and the change to the zoning text is consistent with other similar proposals that have come through ULERP. We therefore urge the zoning subcommittee to approve the actions under consideration. Thank you, thank you for your testimony today. Rich Iorio, I right. and I have uh, Isaiah, just, yeah, and Isaiah, can you just state your full name, because I just have Isaiah, okay, when you get there, just state your full name, thank you. Rich, we'll start with you. Sorry. Good morning, Chair, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Richard Iorio. I work at East River Housing Corp and have been a member at 32 BJ for over nine years. I'm here today on behalf of my union to express our support the project of 1640 Flatbush. As you know, 32 BJ is the largest property service union in the country. We represent over 80,000 members across New York City. Members like me clean and maintain buildings like the one being discussed today. 32BJ and SL Green have a strong relationship and track record of partnership at buildings across New York City. We're happy to report that SL Green has made a credible commitment to providing good jobs that pay family substantial wages to future building service workers at this site. Having a prevailing wage job is life altering. Before I, work in, uh, before I started working at my building where I'm paid a prevailing wage, I had to choose between health benefits and a raise. With my prevailing wage job, I know that my wages in, in, include benefits and annual raises. There are the kind of jobs that, that allow New Yorkers and their families to breathe and live with dignity in New York City. We estimate that the project planned for 1640 Flatbush will generate six new building service workers' jobs, and we believe that they can provide important economic opportunities for our members in the supporting community. We urge the approval of this project. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Isaiah Thompson. I'm the Policy Research and Urban Planning Fellow at the New York Building Congress. Um, thank you for your time this morning. On behalf of the Building Congress, I would like to express our organization's strong support for SL Green and their project at 1640 Flatbush. New York Building Congress has, for almost 100 years, advocated for investment in infrastructure, pursued job creation, and promoted ambitious public-private partnerships in the New York City area. Our association is made up of over 500 organizations comprised 
with more than 250,000 professionals. Throughout our members, events, and various committees, we seek to address the critical issues of the construction industry and consistently promote economic and social advancement of our city. 1640 Flatbush sets an important precedent for responsible development, and SL Green has demonstrated that they are an accountable steward suitable to carry out the project. Downtown Brooklyn has witnessed a remarkable transformation over the past few years. We strongly believe that 1640 Flatbush continues the growth and development in the area while ensuring that the lives of the local residents are enhanced concurrently. The project will have a tremendous positive impact on immediate neighborhood and borough more broadly, bring many local construction jobs to the area, especially the SL Greens deal with 32 BJ Union to provide good living wage jobs in the community. We are proud of SL Greens efforts to increase the affordable housing in the city and their partnership with the local Brooklyn nonprofit Precinct Builders. Transformation of 1640 Flatbush from a gas station to a convenient and convenience store to a beautiful and affordable property is a type of sustainable urban development we love to see. And thank you again for your time. Um, we support this project and encourage you to do the same. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and, and it will be laid over. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that we are joined by Council Member uh, Reynoso. Thank you for being here. Okay. So we're going to take a brief pause uh, and resume in, in a few minutes. Thank you.
Okay, we are back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, are, we have been joined by Council Member uh, Rory Lansman and Council Member uh, Carlina Rivera. Uh, we, are, we are also now laying over LUs 360 and 361 for the former Parkway Hospital rezoning in Queens. Uh, we will now hold our votes. In addition to voting to approve LUs uh, 359, the Thessa Buell LLC Sidewalk Cafe application, which we heard today, we will also vote to file LUs 376, uh, an Article 11 tax exemption application, which is being uh, withdrawn from the package of related applications from the Bondell Commons proposal. Are there any questions from the subcommittee members on this item? On these items? Uh, seeing none, uh, I now call uh, for a vote uh, to approve. LU uh, 359, uh, Thessabool uh, Cafe sidewalk application, and to file LUs uh, 376, uh, an Article 11 tax exemption request being uh, withdrawn from the package of related applications for the Bondell Commons rezoning. Uh, council, uh, please call the roll. Chair Moya. Uh, aye on all. Council Member Lansman. Aye. Council Member Levin. Aye. Council Member Reynoso. Aye. Council Member Rivera. With thanks to the applicant for working with CB5 in our office to address concerns, I vote aye on all. Council Member Gerdanchik. By a vote of six in the affirmative, zero in opposition, and zero abstaining, land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. Uh, yep. We're gonna keep the uh, rolls open for a few more minutes, uh, and then we will return to our public hearings. Our next hearing is on LUs uh, 370, 371, 372, and the 103 North 13th Street Tax Amendment and Related Special Permit Application for property in Council Member Levin's District in Brooklyn. Uh, the applicant seeks approval for a zoning text amendment to include the subject block uh, bounded by Wyatt Avenue, uh, North 14th Street, Barry Street, and North 13th Street within the Industrial Business uh, Incentive Area and a related special permit that if approved would allow an increase in the maximum permitted floor area for specific industrial and commercial uses, uh, modify height and setback regulations, and reduce the applicable parking and loading requirements. Approval of the special permit would facilitate the development of a seven-story building with approximately 10,000 square feet of retail space, 4,000 square feet of office space, uh, and 10,000 square feet of light industrial space. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, uh, and I want to turn it over to Council Member Levin uh, for some remarks. Well, thank you, Chair. I look forward to, uh, uh, to seeing the presentation of the project today. Uh, I want to thank uh, the applicant as well as community members, uh, the community board, borough president for, uh, uh, for considering this application, um, and we appreciate the work of the land use staff uh, here at the Council and the City Planning Commission uh, uh, for uh, preparing for today's hearing, uh, and we look forward to seeing the presentation. We'll ask questions then. Thanks. I'd, I'd, line, I, I'd like now to call up um, Fayan, uh, Batan, Charles Krager, uh, Jeff Rouven, and Nick Liberius. When you're ready to begin, please make sure that the red button is on so that uh, we know that the microphone uh, is on and can uh, capture your testimony. Thank you.
As part of your response, please state your name for the record. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I will. Faye Ann Baton. Uh, Nick Barris. Uh, yes, I will. Yes. Jeff Rubin, yes. I will. Charles Krieger. Good morning, thank you Chair Moya and council members. Um, we are here today to discuss the proposed development at 103 North 13th Street, supported by the City Planning Commission and conditionally supported by the Local Community Board and the Brooklyn Borough President's Office. Um, the proposed development requires a text amendment to the zoning resolution as well as two special permits. Specifically, this application requires the following. An amendment to the IBIA, which is the Industrial Business Incentive Area, the, a special permit section, um, a special permit pursuant to section 74962 for FAR in bulk, and a special permit uh, pursuant to section 74963 for the reduction of parking and loading berths. As you may recall, um, this case is similar to and following in the footsteps of 25 Kent and 12 Franklin Street. However, you'll see this is actually a much smaller project. The actions would produce an almost, almost 60,000 square foot, seven story building, approximately measuring 90 feet to the top of the roof and 109 feet to the bulkhead. And then we could go through quickly. So you could see here on the land use map, um, right, our site is uh, in, the, in the shaded gray area right over here. Um, it's in the one, M12 zoning district of the original IBIA, which was then later reduced. Um, we're, the proposal is expanding the text to allow for our site to be included in the IBIA special district. Um, the proposed project includes four full tax lots and two partial tax lots. Um, and as you can see, you can further see this in the tax map. It's the, develop, the proposed development site is, highlight, is highlighted in red. Um, and as you can see, some photos of the area. Um, history of the site, you know, this is formerly a one-story warehouse. It was, a, it was a fruit distribution center on the site. It was taken down, um, hazardous material removed and remediated. And the applicant now seeks approvals for the special permit. Um, this building would, and I'll, Nick could talk about this more in detail in a second. It's a seven-story building, uh, retail on the ground floor. The second floor would have the required industrial space, and the rest of the building would mainly have office space. So I'm going to hand it over to Nick. Sure, you can stop there. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the building you can see over here, uh, seven stories with this bulkhead structure that's up on, on, on our top. Um, the, uh, the aim of this was three, threefold. One was to uh, keep light coming down, down to the street. We see with all the, uh, with, um, um, all the new development coming in uh, that uh, there's a lot of encroachment on the, the, uh, the uh, sky. So we would like to keep as much skylight as we can coming down to the street. Uh, the second is to uh, increase uh, the quality of the urban streetscape. Um, uh, the zoning text requires that we have a, um, like a sidewalk widening line over here, so we have to set, set the building back a little bit. Um, this is at uh, the terminus of the axis leading underneath uh, the William Vale uh, through the public private plaza, so um, it's a significant addition uh, to the streetscape of, of this area. And <coughs> the, the third aim was uh, to prominently uh, show this, uh, this typical use of this area, uh, which is the light manufacturing use at the second floor. So uh, we have it prominently uh, at uh, the second floor over here. It also becomes part of the streetscape. And then up above, we have uh, five floors of, of uh, sorry, four, four floors, five floors, sorry, of uh, very normative office use. And I think I'm gonna pass this back. You know, I understand that questions will be forthcoming. Um, just to put this project in context, while 25 Kent is almost complete, uh, 12 Franklin just recently passed a few months ago, and the project is, you know, this project is much smaller in scale. Um, for example, 25 Kent is around 380 square feet of floor area, 12 Franklin was approximately 134,000 square feet, and this project's approximately 60,000 square feet. 
um, you know, like the other applications, the applicant will propose flexible floor, floor plates. Um, you know, and I mentioned both the community board and um, Brooklyn Borough President's office conditionally favored um, this application. Uh, we understand that the special permit and the IBIA district are still, you know, experimental in nature um, since none are online yet, but we think it's important to note that the City Planning Commission noted that there had been limited new office and industrial development in North Brooklyn's M11 and M12 zoning districts, partly because these zoning districts allow uh, limited FAR and have a high parking and loading requirements. So this special permit provides flexibility to encourage new commercial and light industrial development, which cannot be built under the existing zoning requirements. Um, it provides this walk to work atmosphere and utilizes, well, these very underutilized lots. So um, that concludes our presentation. We're open to questions. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to council member 11 now for some questions. Okay. Um, I'll ask uh, regarding Community Board 1's uh, recommendations. So they approved with conditions uh, unanimously. Uh, and those conditions are that the accessory retail not be counted as industrial space and cannot be located in the area earmarked as industrial space. Is that something that you're willing to agree to? I mean, so I know with like the, the um, community board and for the Brooklyn Borough President's uh, office, there had been these sort of requirements uh, to, um, and limitations uh, to the accessory space for um, the required industrial space. Um, and the Department of Building sets forth criteria um, for the use groups and accessory space for the use group 16 through 18. So, um, you know, there are concerns and um, the goal, is, the goal is to have, provide a sp flexible special permit and including providing high quality industrial space, which we will be doing. Um, so limits on, limitations on this kind of go beyond right now the Department of Buildings and um, Community Board recommendations and Nick. Yeah, yeah I think uh, to, um, like to kind of allay some of their, their, their fears, um, I think it'll be very tough to actually get up to that second floor space and, and um, like use it as uh, like a proper space uh, for retail just because you have to go through the office course. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if you could, you could really traffic a bunch of retail up there. It's not, it's not really well, well set up and there's no, there's no chance that we would ever supplant that, that, uh, uh, that second floor light, light manufacturing with, uh, with the retail at the, at, the, at the first floor. So I think it'd be really, it'd be difficult to do that. You have a whole, like a whole floor basically which we, which we meet the FAR requirements and you really can't use it as, um, as retail. So I think that they're, okay. that they're safe. Fair enough. Yeah. Yep. Um, they also recommended, um, or their conditions were that the industrial space be rented at 20% below market rate for industrial manufacturing spaces. Is that something that you're considering, or have you been exploring who uh, a light manufacturing tenant could be? Yeah, so um, we've been exploring uh, various uh, light manuf manufacturing tenants. Um, we've spoken to um, uh, uh, an artisan baker uh, in the neighborhood, and uh, there was a someone who does leather leather work. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, in regards to this 20% discount on the light manufacturing space, we, we we really haven't seen exactly what the rents come in yet, as the building is not built. But um, we do know that these rents are going to be uh, substantially lower than uh, we're going to be getting for the office space, um, a 20% discount is, it's not, I, I can't, I'm not, not, not saying that we're going to guarantee that we're going to accept such a number, but we do know that they, would, they will be significantly cheaper, the rents, than, than the rest of the building, and uh, we're open to various different tenants at, 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 this, at, the, at, at, a, at a discounted rate. And I'd like just to add that, you know, it's still, you know, the other projects are offline and with the onset of 25 Kent, we'll have a better idea of the types of rents in the area um, and it's a case by case and we did meet with Evergreen before and we know that there are some potential tenants, so. Okay. Um, can you speak a little bit about any of the kind of resiliency measures that might be incorporated as part of this building? Well, we're, we're out of the, the uh, flood zone over here. Uh, we're about six inches up, so we don't really meet it. Uh, we don't have to meet anything over there. That, that being said, um, the uh, the way that the retail has been set up, um, it you know it could be flood proof in the future. Uh, we have um, um, an extensive green roof planting up on top, you know, which we're also using to retain water. Um, so we're not going to contribute to any problem. 
uh, uh, but beyond that, I mean, it, it uh, would be future proofing uh, that the future tenants would have to take on. There will be a green roof as part of this? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then in terms of um, passive house design or, um, uh, you know, lead certified or any, any of those measures, is, is there any uh, proposal set forth to do that? We're not doing lead, uh, as you know, um, uh, uh, the new DOB stuff basically with all the energy code makes it very, very difficult for us to do anything but something which is, uh, which is very restrictive when it comes um, like to the energy codes. You know, we have very, very robust glass. Uh, we have a lot of insulation everywhere. Uh, so to meet these energy codes, I'd say it's not near, it's not near passive house, but it's really not that, not that far off either. Okay. Um, in terms of parking requirements, I'm all in favor of uh, eliminating parking requirements, and so in this instance, I'm, 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 uh, I'm of the opinion that the less parking, the better. Um, that said, you 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 believe that anybody that does drive to work can find parking at the William Vale. Is that correct? Yes, uh, we've done um, I'd say three three or four parking studies. We've shown that there's ample overage uh, within four four different properties within three blocks of the site. And uh, this was something uh, that we presented uh, to the community board to their satisfaction and that they, they uh, signed off on. Okay. Um, and in terms of, of contracting, I mean, I've, I've gotten some um, uh, uh, concerns about, about um, contracting practices. Um, it, are, with this project, will you, is there an agreement to, um, I mean, the Brooklyn Borough President's recommendation was a retention of Brooklyn-based contractors and subcontractors, especially those designated as LBEs consistent with the City Administrative Code and MWBEs as a means to meet or exceed standards per local law one. Um, have, are you considering any of those measures? And then also with, uh, with building service workers, is there an agreement to, um, uh, to pay building service workers a prevailing wage? But so, um, in regards to um, low, uh, Brooklyn based contractors, we, um, um, the, this building is, um, our, we've, we've done a number of buildings in the last couple of years, and uh, most of our subcontractors are Brooklyn based. Um, I can go through in a couple of names. Um, our window installer, which we've done um, millions of dollars of work with in the last couple of years, is a, w, uh, is a WBE. Uh, based business, and we are open to meeting additional businesses li um, like this. And um, I would say that about 60 to 70 percent of our subcontractors we sign contracts with are Brooklyn based. Um, in regards to um, prevailing wages, um, uh, whatever the requirements are for prevailing wages in our properties, we, we go strictly by those requirements. Um, I believe some of our buildings have a prevailing wage requirements regarding the 421A. Um, I don't, I'm not, I'm not familiar right now with the ICAP requirements on this building. We did file for an ICAP, but if there are requirements, <coughs> excuse me, if there are requirements on the ICAP to hire prevailing wage employees, then of course we will abide by that and do everything that we uh, need to do to, for this building. Okay. If we can continue that conversation, that would be, that would be great. Okay, um, sure. Cause I, I've, I've, I've uh, uh, seen a letter to the community board, you know, outlining some concerns. So I'd mm, like okay. to continue to have sure. that conversation. Okay. Um, uh, why did you, why are you pursuing the special permit as opposed to an as of right development? Is there um, For the as of right development would have um, restricted us to a community, community facility tenants, which would have really limited us to the amount of, to the amount of tenants that would have been able to occupy the space. We also had, um, as we developed the project, um, we Could had- Could you just speak up a little louder into sorry. the microphone? Thank you. Um, the, uh, as a right, uh, as a right zoning would have restricted us to only, uh, community, only uh, community facility tenants, which uh, would have uh, restricted us to our base of tenants we could bring into the building and would have, um, would have been a, a bit of a hardship bringing tenants into the building, filling up, filling up the building. Uh, we also um, uh, incurred a tremendous, uh, um, costs in, uh, um, in remediating the property. Um, as we started excavation, we realized that this was a, uh, there was a lot of hazardous material, and we submitted this property into the state's brownfield program, incurring us uh, almost over $4 million in uh, hazardous material remediation. So um, in order for us to make this project profitable, mm. we had to go through this um, 
uh, zoning pr pr process of going for the special permit to actually see numbers in favor of, of us developing this project. Um, the, the borough president uh, raised an issue around with the, going back to the accessory retail taking up too, too much space and also the, um, the idea that, that like quote unquote digital manufacturing um, may be used to accomplish the intent of the special permit. Um, as somebody that has worked on, on a number of projects with this special permit, um, you know, I, I, I'm concerned that, uh, that it's, we won't be seeing the type of uh, uh, light industrial uses that I think the, the special permit was intended. Have, have, you, have you looked at what type of uh, light manufacturing uses you might um, uh, uh, establish here as a t with, with tenancy? And have you reached out to uh, any of the local organizations that work with industrial businesses, so I can name two, uh, Evergreen and GMDC, which have, you know, a, a large membership of industrial businesses, um, to, uh, to ascertain whether any of their members might uh, be interested in the space. All right, so we've reached out, and I, I'm going to turn this over to Nick, to um, uh, we've uh, had conversations with a various, we've, we've met with Evergreen, and Nick will, can give you more details regarding yeah, sure, the meeting. Sure, so we, we, we actually have a very open dialogue with them. We go back and forth with them a lot because we have other special permit projects uh, that, uh, that we also work on. Um, so, uh, and uh, this is purely anecdotal at this point because you can't, you can't really commit to anything till, till like somebody signs a lease. But we have, uh, we have six, six tenants uh, that were in this area, uh, that have been in this area uh, for some time. There's a watchmaker, uh, there's a motorcycle guy. Uh, he, he, he like fabricates uh, small, uh, like small motorcycle parts. Uh, there's a kitchen cabinet maker. Uh, there's uh, there's other baker. Um, there's two two uh, two uh, two other prospective tenants, and it's a it's a mix. We can't really comment on who will be coming in ultimately, but there is there are definitely people that have been there historically that are still in this mix. You know that we have okay. life not lines with, not just so. digital man quote unquote digital manufacturing. Huh? Not quote unquote digital man but real manufacturing. Real, yeah, yeah. But I mean, there there is there is always a possibility that that that, that does does come in, uh, and I don't know how how uh, like how how we could. Um, speak to that in any kind of intelligible way just because we don't know you right. know, who'll be sure. signing at that time. Understood. So, yeah. Okay. All right. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Council Member Levin. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the panel for coming in and uh, uh, testifying today. Uh, you are dismissed. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify uh, on this item? Uh, seeing none, I now close the hearing on this application uh, and it will be laid over. Uh, our last hearing of the day uh, is on LU's uh, 373, 374, and 375 for the Bondel, uh, Blondell Commons rezoning for property in Council Member uh, Jonai's district in the Bronx. Uh, the applicant seeks approval for three actions, a zoning map amendment to rezone an M11 district to an R7A uh, C24 district. Uh, a related zoning text amendment to map the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing option one and two, and demapping a portion of Finkel Avenue between uh, Blondell Avenue and Waters Avenue. Uh, these actions would facilitate the development of a nine-story mixed-use building with approximately 227 dwelling units plus one superintendent's unit ground floor retail space, community facility space, and 225, thank you, 225 uh, accessory parking spaces. Uh, the application originally included uh, a fourth action seeking uh, the Article 11 tax exemption, which has been, uh, over, uh, has, which has been withdrawn. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application. Uh, and I want to turn it over to Councilmember Jonai uh, for his remarks. Thank you, Chair. We've been hearing very real community concerns throughout the Euler process, and I want to be clear that I share many of those concerns, concerns about overdevelopment, height, density, affordability, congestion, school overcrowding, parking, and many other issues. I'm going to continue to listen to those concerns. In fact, this public hearing is designed explicitly to listen to those concerns and give voice to the local residents who know the area best and who care so much about their communities and are invested 
in our community. There is a very, this is a very large project and with many issues that are still need to be addressed. And I'm committed to working with the community, with the administration, and with the development team to address those concerns and shape this proposal into a project that I feel comfortable with supporting and that will benefit the community as a whole. There's still a lot of work to do on the height, on the affordability, on school overcrowding, and we're not there yet but I'm committed to keep working, to keep listening, and to keep discussing until we get there. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Council Member Jonai. Uh, I'd now like to uh, call up uh, Eric Polotnik, uh, Ian Russ, Ru Russuin, Rasmussen, uh, Hiram Rothkirk, uh, Emmanuel Diamoro, and Craig Livingston. Council, if you could please swear in the panel. As part of your response, please state your name for the record. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. Thank you. Thank you for uh, hearing us this afternoon. Please state your name for the record. Oh, sorry. Eric Palatnik. Hello. Good afternoon, or late good morning, Eric Palatnik. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you to the Councilman Joe and I for all your time and your input on this application. I know that it's caused a lot of sleepless nights for everybody involved, and there's been a lot of discussions on it. And I uh, thank you for your vigorous involvement in it. I'd also like to thank Community Board 10 and Community Board 11. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the history of this application, uh, the rezoning uh, sits on the border of two zoning districts. It sits properly, it resides properly within Community Board 11's uh, boundaries. Uh, and that is, uh, if you're looking at the photograph that's up on the map, on the screens in front of you, uh, that is the area that's in yellow. Uh, Community Board 10 is on the other side of the street. That street that's running uh, uh, down the middle is Blondell Avenue. We are asking your permission here today uh, to rezone Blondell from a manufacturing, this portion of Blondell Avenue, from a manufacturing zoning district to an R7A zoning district with a C24 overlay. Uh, the project is transformative. It's taking a parcel of land that's been historically underutilized and utilized for less than idyllic uh, uses uh, as car auto parts and auto wrecking uh, in an area of uh, the Bronx that historically has straddled Westchester, uh, has caused streets to be unowned, so to speak, uh, which are the streets that uh, go to the right of us, and I'll go through those in a second. So you're sort of in this area that's sort of been in a uh, uh, twilight zone of development uh, for lack of a better term, for the last dec for the last century. Our application, which is a rezoning, uh, checks all the boxes, I think, for a good development. It's next to Westchester Square, uh, which is a thriving, thriving commercial area that's a beautiful, beautiful community that has mosques and churches and schools uh, and hospitals and parkland and ball fields. I counted nine ball fields around it this morning, Councilman, uh, when I was looking at the aerial maps, and I'll point those out. Uh, so although we're asking you for a zoning change from a manufacturing district to a commercial, to a residential zoning, it's really a misnomer here because this block is the one that was up against the railroad yards. It's up against the tracks historically. And in New York City for the past hundred years, we didn't develop against the tracks. It's only a very recent thing that we started to create housing up against the tracks. And we can do that because we have the technology now that can do it. We have the soundproofing technology, we have the construction techniques, and we have the environmental ability to address brownfield sites such as this so that they're remediated properly. I sat at many of the community board meetings, and I know the councilman was there with us at many of them, and there were some very well-spoken reasons why this application should be approved, because we met with Community Board 11 on multiple occasions before we got to the final vote, and there was, there was a lot of support for it, and even the vote at the Land Use Committee was seven in favor. And there were also some well-spoken reasons why it should not be approved. But I believe the reasons why it shouldn't be approved really speak to a fear of, of bringing more people into the neighborhood and creating density in the neighborhood. I, I, and, and I can understand that, but I think we're well suited up against the train tracks uh, on a block that uh, is across the street from an R6 zoning district that we can handle the density. And I'll go through with you a little bit uh, up here to show you what I'm talking about. Uh, this map shows you the proposed zoning designation. And uh, if you could see the map on the right side, it says R7A, that's our proposed uh, zoning district. On the left side, uh, of the map where it says the number 170. That whole side of the street is R6. Uh, 
So you could see, if you look at the R7A and you look on the right side, you could see that we're surrounded by R6, both to the south of us and to the left of us. So we're really following a nice and proper land use rationale here, where we're extending what's already an R6 zoning district into our property. And by covering our property, I should mention, we're, we're proposing a very deep affordability level. And I know there's been a lot of conversation with that with HPD. The project is proposed to be an ELA development. And the ELA development will average all of the AMIs at approximately 73% AMI. And will also include formerly homeless at a rate of 15% within the entire development. Uh, and at no point will anybody that's formerly homeless pay more than 30% of their maximum income. So the project is, is creating a, a housing scenario where you'll have plenty of opportunity for people that are in the community and as well as within greater New York City area uh, to provide affordable housing on this block front. Uh, as I walk you through a little bit on the maps here, I could give you a little bit of a perspective of what the building will look like. Uh, this is the idea of it. It'll be a nine-story building, which is what's permitted in the R7A district. Uh, there will be some dormer areas, which are those little setbacks you see in the, uh, that are sort of the reddish brick. Those will rise to a height of 75 feet. Uh, looking at this illustration, there'll be a parking garage that's on the left side that'll enter downstairs to 228 parking spaces, or 225 parking spaces. Uh, we are grossly overparked. We're only required to have a total of 54 parking spaces. And as I said before, we're, we're proposing 225 parking spaces. And the reason for that is we've been working very closely with the Westchester bid and uh, business improve improvement district, and they've been expressing to us that there is a parking problem, as, as was noted a moment ago in the area, and they, they are always looking for creative ways to provide parking. So one of the facets of this application will be to provide an abundance of parking, not just for the retail uses that are on this property, which will be about 20,000 square feet at the ground floor, but also to service the Westchester uh, Business Improvement District and all the merchants that are there. And uh, we have a yet to be created uh, business arrangement that we will enter into with them to provide parking for their patrons. Uh, the application also has a companion demapping application, uh, which I'm looking for the maps right now to show you that up here on the imagery. I don't know if they made it in here. Uh, but there are two streets that are not shown, as I mentioned before. This map shows it, but it doesn't call it out. The one before this? No, it doesn't show it here. And that, that map didn't make it into the imagery here, uh, but it's best shown uh, on, on this map here. The street we're seeking to demap is Fink Avenue. Uh, Fink is the area that says in white, area of street to be demapped. So the rezoning application includes the demapping of that Fink Avenue, which you can see on the left side extends into Westchester Square. On our property, it extends, to, on our property it extends at the back where the word area is, that is the property that's proposed to be developed. And in front of that is another property owner where there's a church. Uh, and that building w is in the area that we're proposing to demap as well. Uh, Emmanuel is here. He's the project architect. And he's going to walk you through, and it gets to him in a moment, the building itself so I don't spend too much time going through the architecture. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about the application. Uh, or if not, you can move on to any of the other panelists. Thank you. Good morning. Emmanuel Diamor from Afghan Architects. So the facade was intended to mix of uh, materials and colors that will be fine elsewhere in the in the community so will fit within the context and as uh, we mentioned before we're proposing 228 welding units there is if we could walk through the floor plans on the cellar the next page maybe there you go so the cellar we intended to provide an attended parking spaces for 225 spaces uh, there is a huge difference of about a story between Blondell and Cooper so there was uh, some concerns to act, to, you know, to uh, provide less traffic on Blondell. So we're working with city planning to provide another entrance to the parking lot on Cooper, since it's such a, you know, difference in height from Cooper, we could almost access, uh, you know, the cellar parking lot on Gray. And then the rest of the uh, parking lot will be used for storage. On the first floor, we see there is a 20,000 square feet uh, retail space, and then the residential entrance and 10 welding units with outdoor recreation areas, as well as a 2,000 square feet community facility that is all the way to the right. And then on the upper floors, we're providing all the residential units. From the second floor, you have direct access to outdoor recreation areas. And, uh, and there is a total of approximately over 6,800 of indoor uh, amenity space between um, 
you know, recreation spaces, uh, fitness centers, and so on. Uh, in addition to that, the, the units are designed to be uh, family oriented. So we have a 25% two bedrooms and 18% three bedrooms, and I believe 22% studios, and the rest one bedrooms. They also intended, you know, to comply with enterprise green communities. So we pass and exceed 15% of uh, energy code. We have uh, Energy Star windows, Energy Star heating and cooling system. We have extra insulation for the roof and walls. And in addition, the building was designed with uh, active design living intentions. So we have very large windows, and it actually, you know, is designed to promote the healthy habits for the building tenants that we live in here. Uh, good morning, my name is Ian Rasmussen. I'm the principal at Urban Carta Graphics and a certified planner. Uh, Mr. Palatnik asked me to speak briefly about some of the issues related to the uh, appropriateness of the proposal as it relates to neighborhood character. So I'm just gonna quickly go through a few of the issues that I understand have been raised during the public review um, and hopefully we shed some light on the context in which this proposal arises. Um, I wanna start here, but this is just an aerial shot of the larger area of Westchester Square. I think it's important to note that this site is, um, it's at the confluence of a number of major roadways, East Tremont Avenue, Williams Bridge Road, and Westchester, uh, in addition to being a, a business district with a lot of uh, ground floor retail and other stores surrounding this square. And probably most importantly, that uh, it's a transit area. You can see uh, in the triangular park, there's the Renaissance style head house of the number six train stop at Westchester Square. Um, this is the existing context um, and the uh, existing conditions of the development site. And what you can see here is that um, in an attempt, I suppose, to match the context of the rail yard with the zoning, the area was zoned for a very low level of manufacturing development, but um, the decades that followed the 1961 rezoning of the city, uh, there've, there's been a lot of disinvestment. In fact, this is not a particularly great location for manufacturing uses. The lots are small, has poor highway access. And so most of these uh, buildings are underdeveloped even relative to the um, 1.0 uh, manufacturing FAR that's currently permitted. And you can see uh, these buildings that are derelict and have their gates down. This was on a weekday afternoon last week. Um, by comparison, we see across the street, there's a, a three-story residential building. Here's our land use map of the area. The, the large lavender area there is the train yard, but what you can see is that the surrounding area, particularly to the west of our site, is a uh, mixed-use district that includes both a good, good amount of commercial development and a good deal of residential and community facility. Um, highlighted in red there, is just the ground floor retail offering of the neighborhood. I understand there's been some concern that this area did lack the infrastructure or the support for residential uses. You can see we have everything from supermarkets and drug stores, hair salons, restaurants, delis, and the like. Um, there's all over this neighborhood. Uh, what seems to be missing proximate to the train station is, um, is residential use and uh, mixed use investment. Similarly, this area is quite rich in community facilities. So uh, obviously a number of medical facilities in this area of the Bronx, but also um, schools, churches, uh, smaller medical offices. Um, you can see the scale of those here. Um, lastly, I want to point out uh, th there's currently no set height restriction in the R6 and R71 districts. Those are high density residential zoning districts that could, in theory, have much taller buildings. Um, for example, I know we're working on a couple of R6 projects right now that have uh, 13 story buildings on them. Uh, by comparison, the proposed building would be only nine stories and the area to be rezoned would have a hard cap on height at 85 feet or 95 um, for buildings including uh, mandatory inclusionary housing like ours. Um, so show you just the, the scale of the larger residential buildings in the area. Those tend to be about six floors. 
but they have a much greater bulk because they have a higher lot coverage, and so they have um, a roughly equivalent FAR to what's proposed in this case. Um, and last but not least, just as a reminder, this site is extremely transit friendly, and it follows with the city's uh, policy towards encouraging nodes of mixed-use development uh, and nodes of walkability near transit, that this site would be appropriate for a rezoning. Um, it does seem like sort of obvious that um, there should be mixed use dense zoning within just one block of a transit station and the fact that it, this area has suffered from disinvestment for so long is something of a tragedy. Uh, and with that, thank you for your time. Good morning, Hiram Rothkrug, Environmental Studies Corporation. Uh, thank you for uh, letting me speak. Um, we went through four years of environmental review from the Environmental Assessment Review review division of the Department of City Planning. And I'd like to first address the, the council person's uh, uh, comment about schools. While the project only proposes 225 units of, of housing, there are soft sites in the area to be rezoned. So for the environmental review, we were reviewing six different projected development sites. The conclusion with that if, if all six were developed, it would generate 148 elementary students from grades PK through five and 61 intermediate students from grades six through eight. Department of City Planning uh, has an impact threshold of 5% of increase on schools. Our project would only have a 1.4 increase for elementary schools and a 1.3 increase for intermediate schools. Therefore, there would be absolutely no impact to school seats in, in the surrounding district if, in fact, all six development sites were developed. Additionally, the site received e-designations for hazardous materials, noise, and air quality. So the e-designation for hazardous materials would require that the Office of Environmental Remediation DEP and possibly the state DEC would all be involved in the cleanup of the site and a sign off before any residential development could take place. Because of our proximity to uh, rail yards, uh, the elevated subway and uh, also uh, uh, train yard, we have a e-designation for noise requirements which mandates that we have attenuated windows on all facades of our building to ensure uh, a minimum 45 dBA of, of noise attenuation for all the potential residents. Additionally, you have a need designation for air quality, which not only mandates that uh, uh, we have natural gas as our, our resource for, for energy, but also mandates a closed window condition, which means that uh, we have an alternate means of ventilation in the form of air conditioner with HUD approved sleeves or uh, so that in an open window condition, there would be no uh, air quality uh, impacts. Other things I want to talk about is parking. Our, our project's going to generate at a, at a maximum a, a need for 172 parking spaces. We're providing 225 parking spaces, which the community really wanted parking in the area. So we'll have uh, extra parking for, for uh, other, other community services. Additionally, the site is, th there was a I'm community sorry, can you, comment. Can you just go back to the number of parking? We have, we're providing 225 parking spaces. But our EAS shows at a maximum that, we're, we, that the project would, would have a need for 172 parking spaces. So at any given time, there'd be at a minimum over 50 parking spaces available to the community and surrounding uses. Additionally, there was a comment from the community about ambulances uh, going to one of the hospitals and using Blondell Avenue and that traffic would be blocked. The fact is, is that right now there are uh, a lot of auto, auto repair yards, uh, junkyards and everything all, all throughout this particular area. There are tow trucks, there's indiscriminate parking, streets uh, are, are blocked and eliminating those uses and providing residential development will be a safer, certainly a safer condition for, for any kind of transit on Blundell, on Blundell Avenue. Additionally, we did a, a complete traffic study of the entire area, 
and we found that traffic would not be diminished or impacted by any of the residential uses that, that, that would take place. The level of service at all of the intersections would, would, remain, the, would remain the same as it is now. Thank, thank you. Uh, just a, a couple of questions and uh, sticking to the uh, issue of, of traffic, and I, I think you might have uh, brought this up before, but uh, just some, some clarity on it. I know that the borough president uh, had made recommendations to request uh, to explore alternative uh, uh, vehicle access points to this development, uh, in particular along Cooper Avenue in Westchester. Uh, I know you said that you were talking to DOT, but is there, of an, is there more of an update on where we are with that? Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, er Eric Palatnik. I'm with Map to Map uh, to kind of show you what the borough president is speaking to. Uh, Ian, maybe you can click for me and just get me to the map that shows Cooper and Grant. Uh, so this is the part I was speaking to a moment ago because we're the Twilight Zone reference that I used. Uh, the property straddled. Westchester and the Bronx for a century. At some point, it was in Westchester. So the area that's in the back on the right side of the map that you're looking at there, where the word, the I-N-G of rezoning and the A of area are, there's a street there that's called Cooper. There's one street called Cooper and there's another street called Grant. What the borough president was speaking to was to see if they could provide some off-street access to the building through those streets, Cooper and Grant. The reason, the problem we have, and what he asked us to work with his office on, because he works on the street system, obviously, is to find a way to give somebody, whether it be the developer or the city of New York, control over Cooper and Grant, because right now there is no title vested in anybody or any government entity because of this transition through the century from the Bronx to Westchester. So because of that, these streets are not titled in anybody's names. They do exist. As the councilman can tell you, if you drive down there, there are businesses that exist on those streets, and they're there. I don't think they're plowed on a routine basis. I don't think, you know, because the Department of Transportation doesn't have it on their, on their maps. Uh, so that is what the borough president was speaking to. He was asking if we could put an entrance in that back corner behind the red building, uh, which would access, get people off of Blondell, and we are fully committed to doing that if everybody could figure out how to get some entity to have title vested or control over those two streets. Uh, you'll also see a recommendation to that uh, on that same point in the, uh, in the city planning recommendation. Uh, the chair uh, in their report speaks to the stanchion uh, that sits from the overhead pass right in the middle of where the, the letter G sits, which is right in the middle of one of those roadways there as well. Uh, so that was another issue that they'd asked that we work on to address. It's a long answer for two streets. Uh, thank you. Um, also, it's very important that affordable uh, housing projects are creating good quality jobs and uh, not jobs that reinforce the cycle of poverty. Uh, what are you planning uh, to pay the building service workers uh, when your building opens? And what benefits will you provide uh, and, at, and what will they cost the employee. Uh, good morning. One, one second. We got a. You need to. Did you fill out? I did. I'm Craig Livingston. I, there was only four seats here, so I didn't sit okay, down no originally. You get, a, uh, get sworn in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, Councilman Moya, Councilman Joe, and I, and the members of the committee. Uh, regarding your question about the building service jobs, we are currently underwritten to and held to the HDC maintenance and operating standards. The project is uh, not at a point in which we've been able to finalize our funding with both H HPD and HDC. However, we have met uh, with uh, Hannah, who's here today, and Kyle Bragg from 32BJ. We understand um, what financial obligations the building would have to undertake in order to uh, execute a contract with them. It does create some uh, hardship to the budget, but we're working hard uh, with all of our stakeholders to try to figure out how to make that uh, possible so that we can include uh, 32BJ in the project. Well, sticking to that, it's important to us that um, 
members of the surrounding communities uh, have access to jobs uh, created by affor affordable housing projects. So do you have a plan to hire locally and can you share that with us? Absolutely. So um, we have a consultant that's a Brooklyn-based uh, operation, BTN Consulting, that spearheads our local hiring, our local vendors, our MWBE hiring programs, and uh, we take this with a lot of pride. We have several projects throughout the city where we not only meet but exceed our local hiring local vendors and MWB participation in our projects. Most notably, we have a project on 125th Street, the Victoria Theater Project. Some of the team members here have worked on that. Uh, it's a um, state-sponsored project, and although ESD has only required us to spend uh, $30 million with MWBEs, we'll exceed that number uh, at our own volition uh, because we take it very seriously. And will you be able to, to give us that? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, what opportunities for training and career advancement do you plan to provide workers at this project, if any? And what opportunities uh, do you provide for your current workforce? So we do uh, engage in uh, several measures of training for our current workforce, both um, within the building trades themselves. Uh, so for instance, we've uh, recently trained a small cadre of folks on um, uh, roof repair techniques through some program that we hired. We've trained folks on uh, better software uh, techniques that help, better software programs that help them to uh, manage uh, buildings and generate some efficiencies. We've um, also been able to get uh, folks in, uh, involved with other uh, participation in other programs uh, in ancillary organizations. For instance, I'm uh, also Chairman of the Board of the New York Real Estate Chamber. It's a consortium of diverse developers. Right now we're working on a program to bring younger people into the business of development. We want to, to grow the uh, playing field and grow the amount of diverse people coming into the building, into, the, into this um, industry. Uh, just to, not to belabor the point, Councilman Moya, but what we know is that whenever we have a diverse developer in charge of awarding MWBE dollars, awarding local dollars, doing local hiring. It happens more. There's, we don't resist. We encourage this stuff. And so my trade organization is particularly concerned with that. And to the extent that we can bring more young people into the field, uh, we think that we'll help move the chains. Well, I look forward to seeing that happen uh, if this project does go through. Uh, I want to just reiterate the importance of um, good paying jobs uh, with projects that uh, come into the city of New York and why it is critical uh, for local hires uh, to come into these projects right. uh, that uh, folks want to come and do rezonings here. Uh, I think it's uh, critically important to make sure that those issues uh, are addressed uh, moving forward. Uh, with that, I would like to turn it over to Council Member Joe Nye for some questions. Thank you, Chair. Let me uh, just piggyback quickly on uh, the chair's question about local hiring. What can we expect when it comes to local hiring, uh, a typical development uh, that you've done in the city? So um, from a documentation standpoint, we always have a local hiring plan and MWBE, not only hiring, but recruitment, outreach, uh, plan as well because a lot of the times firms will try to hide behind best efforts and say hey we tried we didn't get there will we take it a step further we actually have a well documented plan on how we reach uh, local vendors local members of the community who want to be engaged in employment and also MWBEs and in every single one of our developments we've exceeded this particularly for this project we will have four uh, building services jobs at the end of this, but we will have over 300 construction jobs during uh, the construction of this project. And we are very happy and proud to be able to include local community members in that labor force. Of the 300 construction jobs, what percentage is a norm that is focused on local community hiring? Well, we usually state that in our uh, local hiring plan 
I think we would probably be able to, depending on, on, on the different roles we have, it's actually done by trade. Right. So there is a Build It Bronx program uh, in, that's applicable in your community. We've touched base with some of the local merchants and tradesmen who are in the Build It Bronx program. So we can, for instance, purchase supplies and materials and, build, uh, 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 and appliances from some of these vendors. We can hire uh, the, some of these local merchants and subcontractors to work on, the jo uh, on those jobs. So a lot of times what happens is we find that we get double bang because we'll hire an MWBE that's local in your market and that's a, gr a great thing for us because it's like two birds with one stone. But we really get very detailed in our approach and our plan and by trade, uh, we try to make sure that we have a robust level of local participation by trade. So it's not like you're gonna see a bunch of flagmen on our job and we're gonna say that's our MWB requirement. We want the carpenters, we want the plumbers, we want the masons, uh, the painters. We want to see diversity in, uh, uh, in local hiring along all the rungs of the trades in our project. What is this plan made available? At what point do you come up with a hiring plan? This would be a plan that uh, we have not done it specifically for this project yet, but we could probably get something done um, you know, over the next couple months. We'd have to engage our consultants to start working on it. It would be a little premature because we haven't even gotten close to arranging our financing yet, but we're happy to put it on the table because we take it seriously and we're gonna do it anyway. Thank you. So the whole idea is about not sucking the resources out of a community, giving back to a community, and that's where we're headed with all of this, um, where communities benefit the stakeholders, those that have lived there their entire lives, have shaped the neighborhoods that uh, we come to know and love, uh, and fear of taking advantage of what is typically a quiet, peaceful, community that enjoys many of quality of life issues. Keeping the needs of the community and their desires in mind is at the heart of this. Right. Can you elaborate, and you're under oath, so you're sworn in. How long has this project been going on? How long have we been discussing developing uh, Blondell Avenue? I, th I believe this project's been around for over eight years. Uh, we got into the project by buying it from the previous owner who in, uh, started the rezoning process and at some point uh, gave up. We were able to uh, buy it out from him. He, also, he, also, he does remain in the project as a small uh, partner, but uh, our firm is carrying the, the ball forward. But to your comment about satisfying local stakeholders, that is the methodology with which my firm develops. So we like to take a grassroots approach to development. And if you look at this site, we have here basically a blighted site that has you know, broken down cars and trucks and school buses parked in it. It's environmentally contaminated. We will environmentally remediate this site to what's called the track one under the supervision of the Department of Environmental Conservation Track one is the cleanest use possible for residential occupancy. We've done it before in the Bronx at 1800 Southern Boulevard, and our consultant is here to speak to that uh, shortly. We've also uh, heard very clearly from the bid and the merchants along uh, Westchester uh, Square, the main commercial corridor, and the need that they have for parking to increase the foot traffic and patronage in their stores so they could keep their businesses open and keep employing uh, residents of the community like small businesses do. We've heard from the community the desire to have a school in uh, that area because the school overcrowding. We made the commitment to both Community Board 10 and 11 to work with them to find a school tenant that can occupy a retail space. We've heard the feedback from the borough president's office about traffic concerns on Blondell Avenue and have redirected the entry into the parking garage to facilitate taking traffic off of Blondell Avenue um, while we're still providing parking. We've also heard from the broader New York community about the needs for affordable housing. That's why we're in this business. And we think one of the most important things that we can do, and we're proud to do this work, is to help create housing for families who need it. 
Thank you. Talk a little bit about the Brownfield program. Are you enrolled in a Brownfield program now? This site is absolutely enrolled in the New York State Brownfield Cleaner program already. So it must be cleaned. It must be cleaned. It will be supervised uh, by the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, a gentleman from um, our, our, uh, our environmental engineers today is here. You can speak to the technical aspects of how we're going to remediate it and the level of remediation that we'll do. And as I said before, um, Council Member, we've done this with the same team in much worse conditions in the Bronx. Thank you. So you, you touched on a very sensitive issue. Our current school is at 144% capacity. And I heard earlier that this will have very little impact on the existing schools. We are already at 144% of capacity. We can't meet the current needs of our community. And you mentioned there are six developments that are in the pipeline. No, no there, there's only one development site, but other sites that are in the area to be rezoned are considered soft sites. <clears throat> so we analyze what the potential development of those sites could be, but there are no plans for those sites to be developed. And, and they're not under ownership of the applicant. Right. So obviously the concern from the community uh, is a real one and it's justified that we don't have seat capacity for the I, families that live in the area now. I, y yes, I understand that. <clears throat> How committed would you be as a developer to allocate in the 20,000 square feet to a school specific? We would support the idea if that was the wishes of the community. And we've put that on the table previously, Councilman. We uh, are on board. Um, is there a community facility component here as well besides the 20,000 square feet? There is an additional 2,000 square foot community facility. It's a um, small space, but yes, there is one. And what was the intent of the community facility? Have you made a commitment here? We've or made no commitment, but usually you see community facility spaces being occupied by uh, maybe some type of medical use or um, could be an educational use, you know. Uh, my architect could tell me what the appropriate use groups are for that space, but if it were uh, eligible to be occupied by an educational tenant, we would wholeheartedly support it. So you're open to even changing the layout to accommodate more space if need be for a school uh, that could come into the project? Uh, we could ch uh, change, we could explore, yes, we're open to exploring uh, how to facilitate it, absolutely. Great. So, as you know, um, I've had meetings even uh, as late as this Saturday um, in my office with community stakeholders, residents, um, to discuss Blondell, uh, exhaust every possible option to, we, to a point where we can embrace this project as a whole. Um, the major stumbling block that I see at this point, community loudly has spoken, and that is no. Mm -hmm. If they had a choice, they would leave it as is, contaminated uh, in its current use, rather than develop it. That is the community's very vocal position, and I should say passionate position my phone has been blowing up all morning, text messages and many numbers that I don't even know. In sitting back and looking at, well, wh what is it that we can shape this project into that may be acceptable to you after now versus now? And height and density come into the question. A scale back of this property to six stories, which would complement the other developments in the area. How would that jeopardize your project? How willing would you be to reconsider this development to meet the needs and desires of this community? Uh, Councilman, uh, good question. I would say, to deconstruct the question, 
Um, I know there has been a uh, some loud opposition to the project, but there's also been very loud support of the project. We're proud to have garnered the support of, of the bid. We're proud to have a petition with 200 signatures from local residents who support the project. Uh, we're proud that other business people uh, in the community who provide jobs, small businesses who provide jobs, are supporting the project. Um, now, you know, we're and willing to make any accommodation we can to satisfy the interests of stakeholders and uh, community folks. That's why we've said yes to schools. That's why we said yes to parking. That's why we said yes to environmental remediation. Uh, that's why we said yes to 100% affordable housing. That's why we hope to say yes to 32BJ if we could work out the dollars. Um, but when you start to talk about reducing the size of the building, you, all those yeses start to get walked back. We would like to you're, find- you're on, a, you're on a good trend. Keep with the yeses, we'll be doing okay. <laughs> we wanna um, satisfy as many local stakeholders as possible. But everything that we do at that project is made possible by developing the housing. And to the extent that we make a smaller building, we're saying smaller yeses. Um, we have asked our architect to st start to look at the building and uh, start to think about ways that we could potentially uh, reduce size, reduce scale. Um, the, just from a, and we don't have an answer yet because we got some feedback about uh, reducing the size and the scale not even 24 hours ago. But from a financial standpoint, going from nine to six stories gets rid of a third of the building, 33% of the building. It's hard for us to keep all the commitments we've made to all the other stakeholders with two thirds of the resources that we've previously had. But we don't have a final answer yet. Good, we'll just keep an open mind and work from a positive position. The other thing that came up, and I'm not sure how this impacts uh, your plans for the site. We have a great need for affordable housing, understandably. Half these units will go to the community. Am I correct here? Whatever the project is. That is the priority. current marketing uh, mandate by the city. There is some litigation out there that challenges that. It's above my pay grade. We will satisfy whatever mandate the council and HPD requires us to on so local preferences. Prioritizing at this point at least 50% of the units must be offered to local residents. That's right, and yes. Families. And we will comply. Great. And you'll comply with that and hopefully we can even work to increase that number. Absolutely. These are the real stakeholders. They built this neighborhood and not to benefit from a affordable housing project mm -hmm. hurts. They're, when I say passionate, um, in, this di in my own community, the, the council district, I have 30 civic organizations and community organizations, each contributing to the neighborhoods and the communities that they reside in and complementing one another. They are vocal, committed, mm -hmm. passionate, and will hold everyone accountable to their needs. So anything that we can do to keep the stability of this neighborhood um, is a priority for me. And with that in mind, so is the need for veteran and senior housing. We're losing our residents, these generations that have been there because of affordability. They're being forced out of the communities that they helped build, that they've led, that they've shaped. In your plan, you mention, you don't mention senior housing or veteran housing. Council member, we are, we do have just, um, I, I just wanted to say this, this is a 100% affordable housing building and it's a mixed income affordable building. We are creating house, affordable housing capacity for folks up and down the income spectrum from 100% AMI down to 27% AMI. 
We want to build a community here, not a center of poverty. That's why we have the income diversity. We do have a uh, set aside of 15% for formerly homeless. And just to correct something my attorney said earlier, the average AMI is not 73%, it's 68% 68 is the average AMI. We've lowered it since we started this project based on some of the feedback that we heard at a couple of the community board meetings about affordability. So we're sensitive to it. We believe 10,000% in affordable housing for families and for uh, formerly homeless people and, and meeting the set aside. And when we can facilitate housing for veterans and seniors, we are absolutely on board to do it as well. Can we explore the options of possibly 100% senior housing, would that work for this pro housing plan? It's a, we, so we uh, got some feedback about that yesterday as well. We started to look at it, it's a different financing program, uh, but we will continue to look at it. That would make a tremendous difference um, in the minds and the hearts of our community if we can focus on our seniors and our veterans, and they're both very vulnerable. Um, you'll hear, I, I was approached this morning and You'll stick around to hear the comments uh, from some of our groups, in particular one senior center, which has lost almost two thirds of their seniors due to affordability, right. that they were forced out of their neighborhoods. Yeah. We think it's a shame that people in the twilight of their lives, having been productive citizens uh, in this city, should be facing that. And wherever we can uh, get on board to help, you know, deal with that condition, we are there. And I'm looking at the AMIs, the spectrum, um, where half the, more than half of the units are going to be below 50% of AMI. And for those of you that may not be aware, I believe for like a studio apartment, that starts at $367 a month. Um, and goes up to, Moya, you have glasses. I can't see these numbers. <laughs> <laughs> you have 682. glasses. 682. Now, that would make a tremendous difference. Right. Apartments that range from 300 and change to $682 are being offered uh, to our most vulnerable, and in particular, our residents that have been making uh, some very difficult decisions and about where they're going to live and continue to live. Um, this, this is an opportunity for all to benefit. We just need to shape it into something that's acceptable. Right. And I'm looking forward to continue to work with you uh, in that regard. Thank you, Councilman. And using any influence that you may have to help with the overcrowding of schools congestion options. And by the way, if we go down a senior route, seniors don't drive as much, <laughs> less congestion on the roadways, right. which means we can open up the parking availability to the community residents or shoppers. Seniors typically, and I, I, don't, I know a lot has changed from technology, but they also don't have children. Right, so they're, they're beyond the childbearing years and we don't contribute to the overcrowding of schools. Seniors also don't bring issues to a community. They don't hang out at night and have <laughs> parties and play loud music and the inconveniences that we've experienced in large tenement buildings. There would be a tremendous added benefit here in serving a real need to a vulnerable group and also building on a quality of life uh, that we've come to enjoy uh, and maybe have been privileged to. You did mention parking where, based on your assessment of the 225 parking spots, 50 would only be available to local shoppers? No, so Ian mentioned uh, a calculation that was done in the EAS. Um, so in this 100% affordable housing building, we only require 50-ish spaces. We're gonna provide 225. 
The calculation that he mentioned of 172 was based on a um, environmental impact chapter that he has to write and do a particular calculation. But all t the reason why we're doing uh, accessory parking is it's attended parking, and it facilitates uh, parking for whoever wants to park there. And, uh, most notably, the patrons who would be supporting the merchants and the shops in the Westchester Square community. What is a okay, projected- Councilman, yeah. Councilman, I'm sorry. That, that was a maximum occupancy number. So that would generally take place during the overnight period when people who would drive to work or home from work. But throughout the entire day, there, there'd be a lot more than 50 available parking spaces between 9 a.m. and uh, 6, 6 p.m. I don't have that number right now, but it, it would be quite quite more than the 50 spaces I mentioned. Is there a projected rate fee for parking, especially during that nine to six, or even the monthly rate that's going to be offered uh, to the residents? Do we have an idea of what that may look like? We don't have that yet um, because the parking garage will be leased out to an operator who will set market rates. We have some influence over that, but um, and we pretend, we want to work with uh, the merchants in Westchester Square to figure out some type of uh, way to facilitate parking that benefits the people who support their stores. Look, we're going to have a lot of questions, and I don't want to take up all the time. Uh, there, a lot, many have been here since early this morning. Um, I want to have them and give them all an opportunity to speak up and be heard, and we'll continue some of the questioning later on. And I'm grateful to you for your willingness to work on something that can be acceptable, uh, that'll benefit community, residents, merchants, mm -hmm. and yourself. And if ultimately we come up with a plan that nobody's happy, I think I did my job. <laughs> uh, and I'm striving for that. Right. So I want to thank you, unless someone else has another question, and I ch our chairman stepped out briefly. Um, I'll ask that you be patient in the audience as we call up those that want to be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Public advocate elect, uh, Council Member Williams. Um. Thank you, uh, Council Member John. I, uh, it's elect for another few hours. Um, I do want to uh, shout out. So I am. Um, there was some breakdown in communication. We're trying to figure out where. Uh, so I, f I was not aware of this hearing, or so I would have been here earlier. I just want to shout out former Council Member David Greenfield. It was his tweet that alerted my staff uh, that this hearing was going on, and I want to thank. Uh, uh, Chairman uh, Moyer uh, for, in, in my stead, asking questions that I probably would have, and my colleagues as well. Um, uh, my election will be certified in just a few hours, but I'm proud of my last act as a council member is here, making sure that we have true affordable housing. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, I left uh, remarks on the record about a rezone that's going on that was heard just a few minutes ago at So Green. Uh, I'm diametrically opposed to what they have presented uh, here today. And um, I am happy that also um, CB14 and the ball president, uh, they approved it, but they approved it with some recommendations. Um, both of those groups have uh, approved it, saying that only if they do option one, uh, not if they're option two. Most folks know I am very much opposed to uh, options two and three. I only barely support option one. So I was in communications uh, with them about option one. Also, I wanted it even stronger than option one um, was uh, put in, uh, option one has now. Also, we have questions about prevailing wage, union, non-union, and um, size uh, of apartments. And so none of those questions have been answered as of yet. Uh, I, my guess would be that whoever uh, succeeds me will have similar wishes. And so I'm just asking and hoping that the council will take that into consideration uh, as this project moves forward. So I just wanted to make sure I had that on the record. And again, thank you for allowing me the time. And thank you for pushing those questions in my stead. Thank you to our public advocate, uh, Jamani Williams, for uh, coming here and uh, testifying today. Thank you. Is this your last business as city council member? Uh, I, besides some papers I got to sign, uh, it will probably be my last official act <laughs> as council member. Well, 
Thank you for doing it in our <laughs> committee. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to call up the next panel. I'm calling up the next panel. Uh, John Bonizio. You have to go now. One, one second, one second. We'll, we'll, we'll move to, to the votes for I forgot. Mr. Richie Torres. Uh, continuing vote of the land use items, council member uh, Torres. I vote aye. Thank you for your vote. Uh, by a count of seven in the affirmative, zero in opposition, and zero abstentions, the land use items are uh, approved and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, John uh, Benizio, uh, Yasmin Cruz, uh, Leah Brooks, and Carlos uh, Severino. Okay. And you each have uh, two minutes for your testimony. And uh, just please make sure that you uh, state your name and that the uh, microphone is turned on. We have John, Jasmine. Uh, is it Lara, Brooks, no. and Carlos? Okay, just want to make sure we have everybody. You may begin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is John Benizio. I'm the chairman of the Westchester Square Business Improvement District. Uh, I'd like to start off by uh, saying that I understand and the bid understands how difficult change could be in the life of most people. Um, this change at Blond that is represented by Blondell Commons is a positive change for the community, and I would like to uh, state the reasons why the bid supports it. The project referenced herein requires a zoning change, as you know. We support this change primarily because this parcel has not and should not be used for industrial purposes. For years, the warehousing of motor vehicles on this property has created environmental issues that will remain unaddressed if the current zoning status is continued. A change in zoning would allow this project to go forward and require the developer to address remediation issues. We support this eventuality for the improvement of the district. There is a tremendous need for affordable housing in the district. We support its inclusion in this area as it allows for the increase of foot traffic in the commercial corridor. This will help support the growth of the mom and pop businesses in the bid. The size of this project is consistent with other residential zoning in the district. In fact, properties immediately across Brondell Avenue are zoned R6, and others deeper within Community Board 11 are zoned for even higher buildings. This project, which adjoins a rail yard, would not interfere with views or be so out of place with adjoining structures that it would be considered inappropriate. The plan to expand parking within the project, particularly accessible to the public, will support the bid stakeholders and improve the area. The demapping of portions of Fink and Cooper Avenues is long overdue and will allow the future positive development of the area. The project's location at the southern end of Blondell Avenue will not disrupt the flow of traffic on the square or on sections of Blondell north of Ponton Street. Approval of the rezoning of this block will allow for the informed analysis of future requests of this nature along the remainder of Blondell Avenue and eventuality as the growth, thank you, of East Chester Road takes hold following the inclusion of Metro North's proposed rail expansion in the area. Uh, I just would like to conclude by saying that the, uh, you asked about the parking rates. Okay, I'm sure that they'll be a lot lower than the $35 that the city charges when you get a ticket at one of the meters on Westchester Square, so I think it would be a good deal. And I would ask you, I would ask you all, particularly you, uh, Councilman Joni, to look past the politics and the future of your political future. Thank you. Okay, and, thank, and go thank along you for with your the needs of the today. Thank you for your thank testimony today. Thank you very today. much, Councilman Moyer. Yasmin Cruz, Executive Director of the Westchester Square Business Improvement District. Do you hear me now? Oh. Just make sure the, the red light is on. Yeah, yep. it is yep. on. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Yasmin Cruz, Executive Director of the Westchester Square Business Improvement District. Uh, it's thank you for having us here. Sincerely, the number one concern I've heard over and over again from our merchants is, Yasmin, what can we do about parking? 
obviously this project is allowing for even more parking spaces than they have to allot for, so we're grateful for that. As well as we even have a scenario in regards to our own office workers that had to move out of the Bronx because they couldn't find affordable housing. And I understand the concern about seniors, but the young, the young workforce is also looking for affordable housing, and this is an opportunity for them. I have two brilliant workers that unfortunately are now commuting, and I might lose them because there's not enough affordable housing. So it will, it will provide a solution for the affordable housing as well as the parking, and the merchants, at the end of the day, we're losing businesses because there's no parking. I'll tell you something. The parking um, traffic agents are there in a second, within seconds to give a ticket. <coughs> and it's unfortunate because if you're conducting business, it's hard to run out of the store and pay for your parking ticket. Um, so at the end of the day, I think this is going to provide great solutions for the area. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Leora Brooks, and I'm from the um, Drogs Neck Houses, also a member of the Drogs Neck um, Resident Council. I want to first say, um, in 1970, the Drogs Neck community, that whole area, has been known as having like private houses and very low level buildings. But in 1970, um, well, they had three stories and, and seven story buildings. But in 1970, they 11 story buildings. I've been living in 11 story buildings since 1974. Um, much of the community has come up to par. So most buildings are about anywhere from seven to more stories. And all these new buildings that are being built in our community across the board are well over or about nine or more floors up. So to me, um, this uh, development would be uh, keeping up with the times of things. So to haggle over um, three floors, to me, it's major because that's three floors worth of units of people not being able to have someone where to live. And when we talk about affordable housing, and I'm, I'm hearing about our veterans, I'm hearing about our seniors, but when you say affordable housing, that puts them right there. So that makes it accessible for them, the veterans, the seniors, uh, some of my kids I want to get rid of, you know, the grandkids, whatever, so that they can have housing. I mean, you know, and, um, and what I'm most concerned about, we lost our Woolworths, we lost Harry's off the square, we lost a lot of some of those stores, but we have businesses there. I want to keep Westchester Square for me. It is my right in, as a senior citizen myself to be able to keep my community the way that I'm used to having it. So I like going to the square, okay? Right now, I, if I take the bus there, I have to take a cab back. There's no way of driving because you can't find parking. And you're not going to get nobody to drive you there and wait for you because everybody's afraid of getting a ticket. So, and there's no place, no double parking or anything. So, to me, Thank this you. is a, having this project would be a win win situation. Thank you. And, um, Thank you. We're keeping it to two minutes for everybody. I'm sorry. And Thank it expands our community. I ask, I am for this as well as the Throgs Neck Houses, and I welcome it and I, I ask that you consider it. Th Thank you for your testimony today. Let's, let's just try to keep it to, to two minutes, please. Thank you. <laughs> I got you. Um, my name is Carlos Serino. Um, I got, um, I'm sorry, uh, I got a commercial property um, plush 101 on Worcester Square, not too far from the actual project, which um, it does benefit everybody else from the local businesses, small businesses in the area. Um, parking is the big issue. Um, it'd be times sometimes when I, I have to um, do my deliveries and I got to stay outside just to unload while somebody else brings it in, because if not, I already got a few double parking tickets. Double parking tickets, 115. So those add up. Um, and also, you know, just uh, um, the traffic from Blondell right now itself, that's where all the, um, all the, bo all the body, um, all the body parts, um, 
the tow trucks, it's like, it's really congested back there. So even if you try to park back there as well, it's no parking as well. So the, the project itself for the parking is like a big, a big effect for everybody on Washington Square. Like this, like I feel like um, Washington Square is a big hub for like transportation, the trains, buses, but the only problem is that everybody that goes there, they're really just, you know, taking a transfer from the bus, nobody really stays there to really see what's in that little, little community. So we could bring more housing, more parking, it brings a bigger venue to the actual, to actual Westchester up. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. I'm gonna bring up the next panel, uh, Jose uh, Rosado, uh, Brett Schumacher, Eddie Rivera, and Al uh, Garan. Garoni. So we have Jose. Oh, Jose, yep. Jose, Brett, Eddie, Al, yes, okay. So, Jose, we can start with you. Jose Rosado, I'm a veteran, I'm a senior. <laughs> I, I hear what you people were talking about, and it makes a lot of sense. But I just opened up um, a restaurant right on the square, 123 Westchester Square. That's what Shanghai Red is, it's Chinese and Latin. And I'm very happy to be there. It's a great area, and I think it's going to get better with, with the project, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm here to try to get it done. Thank you. Um, I'm Brett Schumacher, general manager of Metro Optics in the Square. There's been a lot of things going and, and said both ways. Uh, one of the main points has been the parking uh, and traffic for emergency vehicles and everything where I feel the, the parking lot that this would include would actually help traffic on both sides rather than hinder it instead of having double and triple parking along our main streets we can have more free-flowing traffic it's also uh, Again, more affordable housing for employees, for consumers that will help grow businesses in the area that produce more jobs and have more people from surrounding areas want to come to our community, which should be an aim. Also, the area right now is derelict. Having anything make it look nicer and make it more inviting should be a positive. Also, with respect to senior housing and or and veteran, we also have to look towards the future of the Bronx and not just towards the past. Um, and with the schools being over 100%, 143%, I think, Councilman, right? Probably should have been addressed before now. Thank you. Make sure that your microphone is turned on. There you go. Hello, how's everything? I'm a resident on uh, Blondell Avenue and former business over uh, on the square. Can you just state your name? Al Garoni. I'm very proud for the project. Uh, Westchester Square has been long forgotten. It's a great thing for the community, affordable housing, more foot traffic, uh, no more illegal dumping on Blondell and Fink, no more uh, desolate in the evening where you're afraid to walk down the block and getting mugged. Lighting up the neighborhood is a beautiful thing. Uh, I hear people saying, well, it's too tall. I mean, let's go shorter. I mean, isn't New York known for its tall, tall buildings? Uh, 
on the back side, you see the, the thing is all the train tracks. The front is all warehouses. I mean, you're not really doing much. What you want to do is bring people. By having more units in the building, you're bringing more people. By having less units, you're bringing less people. Isn't it that we want more people in the neighborhood for it to go up for everyone? That's all I have to say. I'm really support the project. I wish everything goes great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hi, my name is Eddie Rivera. I'm a um, manager at the a Boost Mobile store on Washington Square and and um, Russian Square. And looking at the pros and cons of the project, I, I think that going forward with the project, it'll bring a lot of foot, track in it, foot traffic into the community, um, affordable housing for the senior citizens, parking, and clean up the neighborhood because I, it, if you know the neighborhood and you drive by the neighborhood, it's, it's really run down tow trucks all over the place, it's an automotive, sort of like if you need a flat tire, you, that's where you go. They should clean up the neighborhood, lighten up the neighborhood, and I think it's a, it'll be a great addition to Westchester Square. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you for being here. Uh, I want to call up the next panel, uh, Juan Clark, George Calle, Deborah Ann Jaffe, and is it Charles Suss? Charles looks like S-O. Is there a Charles in the house? Got it. Okay, just state your name and make sure that the microphone is turned on and. Rabbi, yes. Hello. Good. Yeah. Hi, yes. My name is Juan Clark. I'm the owner of Clark and Signs on the square. And um, I was sitting here, and I w uh, this is all new to me, and I was listening to the panel that was up here prior to me that's proposing the projects. Okay? And I said to myself, like, like, this community now has not, they have not addressed the parking. They not has addressed the school situation. They now have addressed the senior situation. Everything that you guys has, that they has proposed has not been addressed in this community. And now we get a, a, a builder of, that's coming here to try to improve the district. And I'm seeing like, it seems like they're getting some feedback behind it, some negative feedback behind it. And everything they're trying to do is positive. Every question that you guys propose to them, they have given you a yes answer for, except maybe trying to reduce the size of this building. Now, I know myself, if I was a person that was building a project like this, and I know I needed to be able to at least try to find a way to be able to be financially successful in this, right? And reducing this project is going to affect me. What else do I, what way are you putting me in a position to say, scratch the whole project? So there were like 12 things that were said to them, and they had yes to a lot of those answers. And there was very little bit of shaky on the last one. I don't think that because they don't fulfill totally all the needs that the community may want, is a reason for them to for is a reason for us to say we shouldn't accept this project. This is a beautiful building. It's a real modernized building. It's going to bring a lot of joy and laughter and happiness to the community. We don't have nothing like that in the square. And I'm looking at this and I'm saying, my goodness, what a what a lovely project it can be for us to be able to have to be able to fulfill the needs. I mean, they're willing to address the school situation. They're willing to address the parking situation. They wouldn't address the senior situation. What more do you want them to do, to order to build a project? If anyone's was put in this situation, I'm quite sure we feel the same way about it. So I'm here to, to say that I'm totally in favor of having this project done. And I'm ashamed to know that these issues in this community has not been addressed already. That we need somebody else to come into our community to address these situations that's happening. Well, just one that's quick thing on that. Say. We also want to make sure Thank that you. local hires are a priority, um, which is something that has not been addressed yet. So. It's something that we will continue to pressure before we do anything. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Deborah Ann Jaffe, and I would like to thank you for having me speak. The project seems very interesting, and we're hearing a lot of positive feedback from the developers. However, we have to go back to our past, because if we don't deal with our past, there is no future. There is no senior housing anywhere in the district. They either go to assisted living or they move out of the neighborhood. 
to put half the building for senior housing would be great. As for the young people, it would also be great to put the other half of the building for the future. You have to do things intergenerational. You have to keep the old with the new, otherwise our future is doomed. The building is big, there's no doubt about it. Is it gonna stand out? Yes, it is. But I, as a woman who've lived in this neighborhood for 57 years, would not walk down that street at any time of the day or night. So I feel the developers are doing a good thing. However, we really need to push senior housing that's affordable. As far as the parking goes, it's great because the store owners are losing a fortune because people cannot go and park. However, the parking needs to be affordable as well. As far as putting a school in, that's great, but what about putting in a senior center? What about putting in a medical facility that seniors can go right downstairs? There's a lot of possibilities, and I think you need to keep the communication open. Councilman Joni, I, I know you're on this, and on behalf of 750 seniors that live in your district, we are begging you to deal with these developers and have senior housing as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chair, thank you for uh, having me here. My name is George Calley. I'm a resident of the area, a constituent of Mark Joni. I applaud his, uh, his statements here today. I do want to start with due respect uh, by thanking you and the council for the tax dollars that I pay for the two minutes that you're affording me um, after an hour and a half ride here and all the listening that I had to do and the kind of drivel that came out of the one man on the end saying there was no impact on our schools um, and that they're not in this room anymore speaks volumes to me. And I came here to support this, but I think there's something to be said about the demeanor of the people that we're dealing with. So let's not feel bad, sir, that we're demanding things for our community. And the things that we are demanding for our community here today, if you will, are the same things I echo uh, uh, the, the councilman's uh, requests. Um, we could talk about that six story, nine story situation if 100% of that is going to be senior and veterans. Because those are people that are being pushed out of our community that built our community. Mark is 100% correct about that. Um, and we could talk about that, that nine floors, but that's a negotiable. That's what business is. They're going to tell you they can't make a profit, but we're going to say these are our needs as a community. Let's not lose track of that. Let's not, let's not lose track of what congestion is all about when he says that he did the traffic studies and there'll be zero impact. That's the same zero impact that our schools are going to have. So no, we're going to negotiate hard with this crew. We're going to re require as in return for this development to go forward from our community, we want it to be elderly, we want it to be veterans, we want it to be affordable, we want, um, I think I even want that school down there as well in that retail space. And then we can, we can back off of that in some measure, but we start with that as our position. That's our position. And I think our councilman has our back. Thank you for that and um, we have your back. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. The next panel, uh, we have Dorothy uh, Krynick. Krynicki. Krynicki. Thank you. Carl Anderson and Yanni Hernandez. Hey, when? Dorothy, we'll start with you. Dorothy Kornicki, Worcester Square Zurigar Improvement Organization. I'm a real live community person, third generation living in the neighborhood, so you're going to hear a different perspective opposed to the zoning. However, I'm a realistic Bronx kid, okay? Um, number one, um, we do have senior housing on Parker Street in conjunction with Project Rain. We also have affordable housing on Westchester Avenue. We are not opposed to affordable housing. However, those two other things those two other buildings are within the context of the neighborhood. This is an oversized project for a very narrow block. 
We believe in affordable housing, but we don't believe in warehousing. And part of this, I'll, I'll, I'll quote, I'm going off a little on a tangent. First of all, um, the developer said this project's been in the works for eight years. We only heard about it about three months ago. Community Board 10 and 11 voted it down. John Benizio and the Westchester Square bid are not our elected officials. They do not represent the community. Um, ironically, the merchants on Blondell Avenue are not even in the Westchester Square bid. How about that for uh, an interesting point? Um, so we feel if you're gonna approve the zoning change, scale it back. I'm gonna quote a Columbia University professor named Professor Plunz, P-L-U-N-Z. He believes in housing, but he also believes that you have to maintain a community. These outsized, overscale buildings will not create that sense of community that we old timers um, have always felt about our neighborhood. It's been a mixed income neighborhood all my life. But the housing is five to six stories high, courtyards in between. This is just a monolithic structure. The sense of community that we know and love is not old fashioned, believe me, when I say that. So our objection is to, at this point, change the zoning, fine. But um, what the developer said about a school, I'm a retired New York City school teacher. No school would be able to fit there. Take it away. Oh, oh, I saw, okay. So I'm opposed to it, but with scaling it down, if these guys cared about affordable housing, they'd take a cut in a few bucks. And I realize they have to pay for remediation because it's a brown zone, and number two, FEMA has it as a flood zone. I'm, Car I'm Carl Anderson. I'm a resident on Blondell Avenue. I'm also a physician. And first of all, I wanted to you know, say I appreciate your, your comments, Councilman Joan Knight. You, you're listening to us. We spoke with you. We appreciate your listening to us. Um, I'm, I'm speaking in opposition to this proposed rezoning application. Zoning was previously reviewed and revised for this community in 2006, and this, this street was kept at M1-1. And immediately across from this project, it's still M1-1. I, I looked at the map um, on the other side of the streets. Community boards and 10 have already voted down this uh, change. This area already has a very large area zone for commercial and residential, a much, area zone, a much smaller area zoned M1-1. And I think Blondell Avenue is ideally suited to M1-1. It's a very nice street. And I think for some people that say it's derelict or it's dangerous, I just don't feel that that's the way it is. It contains low-rise commercial buildings and residents. Uh, new businesses are being added all the time. There's a business making custom t-shirts, a glass and mirror business, an electrical contractor, a fire sprinkler company, modest three-story apartment buildings, private homes, a business providing services for people with developmental disabilities, a floor and office cleaning service, a number of automotive businesses, and these businesses provide good jobs. So I, I think this, this proposal of this nine-story building is just much too large for this neighborhood. I'm concerned about over-congestion. It's a narrow, busy street, and there really is a concern about ambulances getting to the hospitals. This is a key, key way of, of getting there. Um, concern about parking. Um, uh, we all understand the need for a, uh, affordable housing, but an outsized development like this is not the way to accomplish it. Accomplish it. There's other areas, there's other places in the area where you could put this that would be more appropriate. I think that zoning changes have to be considered for the whole community and not just change for in a particular area because the developer wants that request. So I recommend that it keep uh, the classification of M1-1 and consider zoning for the whole area before making changes. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, Chair Moja. Um, member of the commission. My name is Jenny Hernandez. I am, have been a member of 32BJ for 12 years. I am here today on behalf of my union and as Bronx residents to share all concern regarding the proposed development Blondel Commons. As you know, 32BJ support the development of affordable housing. We also believe that developers should come in to providing good jobs that pay the area standards building service, job in order to build a more fair economy in the New York City. Blunder Equity LLC, an affiliate of Exact Capital, has yet to make a credible commitment to good industry standard jobs 
for, build, um, for building service once the project is complete. I have lived in affordable housing in the Bronx for 18 years. I know how important it is for workers to make good industry standards. My job changed my life. My job made me feel safe and secure because I can pay my bills without worries. I don't have to worry about health care. I can give my son a good life with his security. All family deserve this. A project like this, with which will have unit target and 90% or more of the ANI, and by finance with the taxpayer money, should create good job for the local community. Affordable housing is supposed to help lift up community like mine and not leave one behind. Working families in the Bronx, like mine, deserve housing and job that allow when we live with dignity and security. We need good jobs because they help us remain in all communities. We have been in conversation with the stockholders on this project and we hope that it put toward the good jobs. We are calling on the city work with the developer to ensure good industry standard for workers at the projects before it is approved. Thank you. Thank you uh, for coming to testify here uh, this morning. Calling up the last panel, we have Lou uh, Rocco and Egizio Cementelli. You can, yeah, make sure that the microphone is, is on. The mic is on. Okay. Um, my name is Lou Rocco. I'm the president of Westchester Square Civic, longtime resident, and uh, I uh, was retired from 32 BJ. I spent 10 years, so I know their plight of trying to get good jobs and trying to get these people working in buildings and have quality uh, maintenance in these buildings, which when I hear developers and all they say is that they're trying to get cheap, inexpensive people to maintain these buildings if they ever get built. To begin with, I am totally against this type of building. I'm totally against the placement of this building. What they're gonna do is start warehousing people. We are supposed to be in a new century where you give them quality housing. The problem in Westchester Square with the parking can be resolved. When I see community boards approve taking away spots in Westchester Square, it's approval. We had members from St. Peter's Church come, and they cleaned up a part of St. Peter's Church which gave them 10 cars of parking on the street. Personally, I have taken 28 vehicles that shouldn't have been on the street. We need enforcement. I applaud the traffic agents for making the traffic move, and we need more input into the community. Councilman Joni, I wished I was invited to your meeting on Saturday. You know, I would have put my family uh, situations aside to make it because I feel strongly that this community should survive. Our community has been advocating for schools. We do not have a school. And all these problems compound, which if we had these issues resolved, we would all work together. Our business district is failing. Mom and pop stores need to thrive, not big businesses where you go and buy $300 sneakers. I will never afford $300 sneakers. I am totally against this project. I hope that the city council votes it down. Thank you for your time, and I want to be very respectful to the council members and thank, thank you so move much. on from that. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Chidio <coughs> Sametelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Has my time begun? Do I? Yep. Oh, yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, 
This is, I participated in five meetings. This will be my sixth meeting. Community Board 10, Community Board 11. Obviously, there were, uh, both boards turned it down and voted against it, disapproved this project. And, uh, but uh, and if you heard a lot of the talk already, but I want to talk about Mr. Joni. I want to talk about our councilman. I want to talk about the unethical approach to this situation that he's taken. Uh, he's taken a very low road Let, here. Let's, let's, let's well, I, to the this topic. is part of the process. Right. It's but, part of the but process. To say because that someone is unethical is 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 not what we do here. If you have a problem with the project itself, that's uh, fine. Well, we do stick but to the project. But again, please refrain from saying anything like that to a member who's been here, who is actually sitting at this committee, listening to you, answering the questions. Let's be respectful, please. Well, this project was brought to this area by assemblyman. Join I two years ago, brought this developer to Community Board 11. And then Jimmy Vacca, prior councilman, disapproved this project, th did not support this project for over 10 years. Only when Mr. Joe and I revived it with this developer, we have this sitting here. We have this, this project that you cannot open windows, you cannot uh, open, uh, they call it uh, exclusive housing, uh, they projected this. Uh, meantime, you can't open your windows as uh, it's warehousing of people. And the councilman went and intimidated our community boards, both community boards telling them that there is a narrative, this false narrative, that the boogeyman, that the city has targeted community board 11, and they're gonna put a homeless hotel. This is this boogeyman concept, homeless hotel in this project unless we approve it. This is what's unethical. He went to two community boards, sir, after they took their vote, two community boards and said the same false narrative. And he should be ashamed of himself. Thank you. And this is, a, he is a bully when, an Thank you for when your the power testimony. of an assembly, when a councilman speaks, he becomes a Thank bully. You. Thank you for your Thank testimony. You, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. We, we have been joined. We have been joined by Councilmember uh, Richards. Uh, Council, please take his vote. Uh, on a continuing vote, uh, Councilman Richards. I don't know. Thank you. I vote of eight in the affirmative, zero in opposition, zero abstentions. The uh, land use items are approved and uh, referred to the full land use committee. Are there, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application, uh, and it will be laid over. Uh, this concludes today's meeting, and I would like to thank the members of the public, uh, my colleagues, and of course uh, the Council Land Use staff for all the great work uh, that they do uh, each and every time we have these uh, hearings. Thank you. This meeting is hereby adjourned.